Hi Euro, this is a video about European exploration, global exploration that happens during period one between 1450 and 1648 and also goes into period two into 1648 to 1815. Um, and the things I have in front of me for reviewing, I have my McKay book, chapter 14. You're also gonna look at chapter 17, it goes into there too. Um, and I've got the crash course book right here. There, I also have this course at a glance page um, there's a PDF of it, a copy of it, and um, what I'll be looking at today, we covered this part in the Renaissance unit. Um, today we're going to be looking at technological advances, rivals on the world stage, colonial expansion, the Colombian exchange, the slave trade, commercial revolution, okay? Um, again, the, uh, the global exploration is happening within the context of the Renaissance is going on between 1400 and 1648, the Reformation is going on during the same time, and you also have global exploration. Now, um, the main date for global exploration, let's see, global exploration is 1492. And that's the date when Ferdinand and Isabella, the new monarchs from Spain, send the Italian sailor Columbus from Genoa. Um, so Columbus, in quote unquote new world. Not really new. We've been here for years. It's new to the Europeans. And this, um, again, because it's new to the Europeans, whoops, sorry, it's a little, um, because it's new to the Europeans, it's not new though to the people who live there. The Europeans, uh, their world um, had expanded greatly. So during the Renaissance, they're looking toward the Romans and the Greek to expand their knowledge. They're also trading with Muslims and their knowledge of the world is expanding through that. Uh, but then um, there's this whole other hemisphere of the world and this blows their mind. This, uh, just the fact of seeing all the new, um, this entire new world challenges ideas of the church that didn't say anything about the new world in the Bible. It challenges ideas of the Romans and Greeks who had no idea about the new world. And so this is part of this journey of scientific discovery that um, changes um, intellectual ideas um, in, uh, in European history. And so uh, just because 1492 is when they found the new world doesn't mean that they weren't trading and exploring with the world. Uh, and so before then, uh, they traded what's called your Eurasian. I'm not Asian, Eurasian, Eurasian, as in European and Asian trade networks. And this is when the Europeans were not very popular. You know, Europe is up here, and then you have uh, the Ottomans, and you've got India, and then China, and all the spices are in China, the silks, uh, they're is uh, sailing and cloth and cotton in India. Uh, the Ottomans have um, spices and oils. Europe has um, uh, has sheep. Uh, and also in Africa, there's gold, there's salt. Um, and, uh, and so this is the trading network uh, before 1492. Uh, and we, we've seen the rise of the merchant class during this time within the context of this leads to the powerful city-states in, uh, in Italy, which, in Northern Italy, which forces or creates the Renaissance. But then uh, with the new monarchs in Spain uh, and the new world is quote unquote discovered, uh, first there's the discovery. And I want you to think of it in terms of uh, how is it discovered and then conquered? This is what we looked at. And it was similar to our imperialism unit. We looked at the technology and then we looked at motivations. And with motivations, uh, well, first with technology, okay? There was military technology. For example, they had, they were able to have steel. We watched that film and read some excerpts of the book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. They had steel, they had horses, uh, they had gunpowder, remember the harquebus? Then they had navigation technology, like the compass and the, or the magnetic compass, right? They also had the astrolab. They had Ptolemy's map or the Portolani map. Um, they also, with their shipbuilding, they created caravels. And caravels had, um, remember, a Latin uh, sail or triangular sails. 
and a stern post rudder. These were all different technologies that allowed the Europeans to sail beyond the coast. Uh, instead of looking toward the coast, they could look at the stars through their astrolab. They had ships that could sail against um, the current using the wind with the uh, triangular sails and the lateen sails. Um, and so they're able to go further than um, Europeans have gone before. What were they motivated by? Similar to the um, to imperialism, we looked at economic motivations, cultural belief, and competition. Uh, here we set it in terms of gold, God, and glory. And how can you otherwise explain this? Well, gold economics motivated them. It's not just gold. They're going to also find a mountain of silver. They're also going to find mountains of uh, cash crops, right, that they're going to make fortunes off of. God, this was the missionary impulse or the uh, to convert uh, to Christianity. And this is going to bleed into the counter-reformation, right, with the Jesuits. They're going to go abroad and try to convert people um, in other parts of the world, right? The, in Europe, they're revolting against the Catholics, and so the Catholics think, okay, if I can't get Europeans, I'll get people in the Americas and then, uh, or in Asia. And that's how the Jesuits are, uh, one of the purposes of the Jesuits. And then glory, this has to do either with competition between nations, between nations, and also uh, for individuals to find fame and fortune. And we see this especially in, um, in who takes the lead? It's Spain and Portugal. Spain and Portugal initially. This gradually goes from these two Mediterranean states to Atlantic states, where there's a decline in Spanish and Portuguese power. And gradually over the course of 1400 through 1600 and beyond, it goes to the Atlantic states, toward the Netherlands and to England and France, who eclipse Spain and Portugal um, with their power. Uh, but we start with Spain and Portugal. And so think 1492, that's Columbus. Shortly thereafter, uh, the conquistadors come down. And the two most famous of them were Cortes, Hernan Cortes, and then there's also Francisco Pizarro. Pizarro conquered the Inca people, the Inca empire of, um, of South America, in uh, basically going up and down the Andes. Uh, and then the Mexica Empire was um, conquered by Cortes, uh, the modern day Aztec people, or the Aztec society in Tenochtitlan, modern day Mexico City, and Montezuma. Um, and so Cortes was in Mexico. And we saw how they, uh, they used similar strategies. We looked at that in class. They both, uh, they would capture the, um, the, the king, uh, hold them for ransom, uh, and, but, and, and use their superior, the horses, the steel uh, rapiers, the swords, and the harquebus and cannon, where a very few amount of Spaniards were able to defeat a massive amount of people. But it wasn't just what they were carrying, uh, riding or carrying, it was also disease. And so disease and the disease of smallpox uh, killed up to 90% of native peoples. Uh, talk about, uh, it was the worst pandemic the world has ever seen, worse than the Black Death. Uh, it, it absolutely decimated um, American society, uh, where Native Americans uh, really didn't stand a chance after being destroyed by this disease. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, when the, after the conquering of the people, um, they're, they at first enslaved them under something called the encomienda system. And you can look at that, which enslaves Indians. Sorry, not Indians. Why am I saying Indians? Of course, India, Columbus thought he was on his way to India. He was wrong, and that word has persisted, and it even comes out and educated people like me. I'll still say ignorant things like Indians and Native Americans. Um, they were enslaved under the encomienda system uh, and forced labor, forced labor in mines and plantations. Uh, the largest uh, mountain of, of silver was found at Potosi in modern-day Bolivia. Um, but uh, 
too many Native Americans died. And so what do the Europeans do? Um, they don't decide to work themselves. Instead, they go to Africa to get slaves. And so this is where um, uh, slaves from Africa replace uh, Native Americans. So slaves from Africa then come in to replace the Native Americans. And this continues from um, the 1500s all the way through the late 1800s, 300 years of subjugation, of chattel slavery. Um, and, uh, and so the Spanish also create this racist system, the Casta system, if you remember this. Casta system, which is a hierarchy, a racial hierarchy, where the only people who have power and privileges are, uh, are white European Spanish people. And they give different names for different races in order to deny them privileges and power um, from these words like mestizo or zambo or negro um, or indio. Uh, and that's the casta system. Okay. Um, while this is going on, this domination, what are the effects of it in Europe? The effects or extreme wealth. Um, there's an influx of silver. Extreme wealth from silver. Uh, also, the Colombian exchange. When the Western and Eastern Hemisphere come together, there's a, an exchange of people, of different races of people, um, people of diseases, of plants and animals. And for the most part, these disease, these plants and animals and people make the Europeans extremely wealthy. Uh, for example, the plants, um, one or first are cash crops, which basically are crops that are grown not to be eaten, but to make money off of, such as cotton. Uh, think of uh, the uh, a student sitting in a chair at school wearing a cotton t-shirt or in purple. It's made of indigo and coffee and chewing on some candy and sugar. These are, and, uh, and has their jewel pen, the tobacco. These are all cash crops that require, are not necessarily, are not necessary for human survival, make a lot of money and require slavery. And also, do they do any good for people? I would argue no, unless you need coffee and cigarettes and purple clothes to survive. Um, but uh, cash crops uh, are a large uh, source of income. Um, remember, uh, let's see, um, tobacco is native to the Americas. Uh, these are old world um, uh, crops, all right? And so you have a this um, mixing of old and new world. Um, old world diseases, if you remember, we had two different, we talked about two different tacos. One was a new world taco, one was an old world taco. Like the old world had a flour tortilla. It had animal meat, so like cow um, or pig. Um, new world, uh, it was a corn tortilla. It had avocado, peppers, right? These were uh, ideas of new world food versus old world food. And there's this big mixing together. Um, and animals, similarly, like the horses from Europe, um, any barnyard animal, the only larger animal was the llama. Um, people, um, it's a collision of people of different worlds, diseases against smallpox from the old world, the new world disease of syphilis affects people. And so this creates... Um, wealth for Europeans with huge influx of silver, with uh, money raised from these cash crops. Also, during this time, you have what's called the triangle trade. And you have, ooh, remember this? <laughs> this right here is Europe. This is Africa. This is uh, the Americas. And so this was called the Middle Passage from here to there, going from Africa to the New World is slaves. And then from the New World to Europe were the raw materials. And then from 
uh, Europe to Africa were manufactured goods that they would then trade for slaves. And then this cycle continues, and this is what's called the triangle trade based on this, this triangle of slavery, of raw materials, and manufactured goods going around and around. Don't confuse the triangle trade with the Colombian exchange. They're two different things. The triangle trade means this, this trading of slaves, raw materials, and, um, and manufactured goods. The Colombian exchange is old world versus new world, okay? This is a, a natural just mixing uh, that happens once the new world and old world uh, come together. Okay, um, and then I want you to remember especially uh, slavery. Uh, we looked at the conditions on, on slave ships. This is one of the first, uh, one of the two genocides that are taking place at this time. One is the destruction of the people, uh, the Native Americans, and the second is the um, forced um, enslavement of Africans. And think about the conditions on the slave ships and on the plantations that we looked at. All right. Um, this causes extreme wealth. Uh, for European people, and it causes extreme hardship for the people of Africa and the Americas. Okay, so we've got, uh, what did this all start with, this whole idea of 1492? Think of what happened before. Think of what it's going to lead to. It's going to lead to extreme wealth um, for Spain and Portugal. However, that's going to shift to England and France as we get to the 1600s. Um, and then think of the technology that allowed them to do it, to dominate this part of the world, the motivations of gold, God, and glory, uh, the specific um, actions of the conquest with Cortez and Pizarro, uh, the systems that were put in place uh, in order to make money. This is, a, um, this is similar to imperialism, right? Col colonialization. Um, and so the Colombian exchange, the triangle trade, and uh, there's a decline of Spain, which seems strange, even though they're getting so much um, wealth. Uh, remember that they have kicked out their bankers, they've kicked out their manufacturers, and this influx of silver, um, along with the lack of manufacturing uh, from expelling the Moors and the lack of banking from expelling the Jews, um, has caused causes Spain to decline. And so um, the silver causes inflation and, uh, and no manufacturing. It causes their internal economy to collapse. No manufacturing is what that says. On the other hand, where are their bankers and shipbuilders and merchants in the Netherlands um, and in England also? And so in the 1600s, the Netherlands, this is called the Dutch Golden Age. And these merchants become extremely wealthy. In England as well, um, led by uh, Queen Elizabeth, that's the golden age of, of England, um, also becoming extremely wealthy. And a couple ways of with which they did that, these new um, economic technology of joint stock companies, meaning all merchants pay in a little bit of money to buy a share in a boat. And if it comes back with a lot of money, they all get a share of the profits in a joint stock company. And this is how England um, founded colonies in the Americas, uh, New England. Um, uh, think of the East India Company, uh, the West India Company, um, the Virginia Company. Um, and then there are other companies, uh, these corporate groups, a corporate or a corporation, a sharing or a body of, of investors who um, who are um, taking a risk and investing money and sending ships out and uh, and then and then selling it upon the return. And so that happens in the Netherlands and it happens in England. Uh, also a rise of banking and also a rise of banking uh, here in England in London in the Netherlands um, in Amsterdam and Antwerp. Um, and then. Uh, We'll get into later, there are different policies of mercantilism that happen in, in the next unit when we look at absolutism, in the next period, let me say, um, in which the, uh, uh, the governments of England and France that have strong centralized kings, uh, they're able to take control of the economy and use their, um, their imports and exports and also their colonies to their advantage. And so you have a growing of um, 
of business during this time, going from you know small feudal business growing to these national scales of business. Uh, and this is what's called the commercial revolution. And, um, and yeah, I'll leave it at that as we hit 20 minutes.